My name is Bill Dush, and I'm a member of the Graduate Student Association. Our next professor is Dr. Jerzy Rizillo, Distinguished Professor of Electrical Engineering. Dr. Rizillo's research activities are in the area of manufacturing methods and devices for semiconductor micro and nanoelectronics, as well as the processing and characterization of electronic and photonic materials. He is also a creator and the author of the semiconductor portal, semi1source.com. We are very excited to have him here today. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Rizillo. Thanks for having me. Uh, I would like to talk to switch gears. Uh, we'll be talking about slightly different nanotechnology, although what Professor Gross was talking to us about is also nanotechnology related, except that it's bio nanotechnology. So there's a very close correlation between what I'll be talking today and, and bio nanotechnology. My outline is very simple minded. I'll be talking about nanotechnology and then semiconductor and semiconductor nanotechnology. So it's not much interesting. <laughs> Uh, first, I would like to remind you what nano stands for. Nano is a prefix in the metric <coughs> multiplier in, in the metric system and, and basically follows a centimeter, millimeter, micrometer, and, and, and this uh, <coughs> 10 to minus 9 meter, which is one billionth of the meter. Okay. How does it translate to the physical object that we are uh, interacting with? For instance, uh, we associate certain things with being thin or being very small. And how does it really relate to micrometer or paper, for instance, uh, very thin paper is 100,000 millimeters thick. Okay. Uh, human hair, okay, if you have any, 50,000 nanometer thick. Uh, f very fine sand, sand grain, 50,000. Dust particles, thousands of hundreds of, of uh, nanometers, even the poppy seed, which 500,000 uh, nanometers as well. Now, in, in the bio world, uh, nanometers are very common, although if you notice, most of the building blocks that we are made out of are mostly in micrometers, right? So we are built in microscale rather than nanoscale. That's something we, I think is very interesting because we are intervening in, in, in the nanoscale and into the micrometers uh, world. Anyway, to make a long story short, first thing you may want to remember from this is, is that atom in size varies depending on the element, can be as small as 0.1 nanometer in the case of small hydrogen atom, <coughs> 0.5 nanometer in the case of fairly large cesium atom. But we are talking nanometers, so whenever we referring to our manipulation at the nanometer, 5 nanometer level, we are talking manipulation at the truly, truly atomic level. Okay. Uh, if you look at the, at the, for instance, neurons, we know we're thinking about neurons now. Uh, uh, Professor Ross was referring to the length being one meter or more, but in terms of diameter, we are talking uh, nanometers, although high nanometers. Uh, you look at the virus, 20 nanometers, red blood cell, thousands of nanometers, bacteria, also thousand nanometers. Okay. Now, how about what we are doing at the, at the nano level? Well, we are pretty good at manipulating matter at truly very low nanometer regime. We can create nanowires, which are maybe 30, 40, 50 nanometers in regime. We are building quantum well laser, I'm sorry, we're building quantum well laser diodes, which contain layers that are one nanometer thick. We are uh, synthesizing carbon nanotubes, which are 1.2 nanometer in diameter. Uh, we are creating crystalline dots which are maybe 10 nanometers in diameter. Those are individual atoms. Okay? And, and we have full control over how many atoms we put in the dot like this. So we, we gain a, a, a capability which allows us to manipulate matter at truly, truly atomic uh, level. This would be a, a state of the art transistor that you have billions of those in every microchip in, in your laptop. And we are talking geometries in the range of 22 nanometers into the gate length, thicknesses of materials 1 nanometer, 6 nanometers, so we are really fully into, into a nanometer regime with, with uh, technology that we have available for us. I would like to distinguish between nanoscience and nanotechnology. Nanoscience, as kind of my definition, is, is exploring at the nanoscale fundamental phenomena in the world surrounding us. Nanotechnology is, is what it is. It's basically manipulation of matter at the nanoscale, aiming at accomplishment of a specific goal. 
There's a significant difference between, between these two because nanoscience exists since 200, 300 years ago. Our colleagues physicists back in the 19th century, they were predicting theoretically physical phenomena at the atomic and molecular level, except they didn't have tools to do something about it. Now we have developed tools and we moved into the stage which we can refer to as a nanotechnology. We have learned how to manipulate matter at the nanometer level. So how do we come to this? What, what was the driving force behind all this? Well, the answer is really fairly simple. Okay? It's always based on, on semiconductors and, and improvements that we are uh, kind of working on for the last 50 years since the invention of, of transistors. Semiconductors are solids which are sitting in between insulators and conductors in terms of electrical conductivity. But unlike insulators and conductors, we can control conductivity of semiconductor with a very broad, broad range. Okay. So copper being metal being conductor will always be very good conductor. There's no way we can make it into the insulator. Vice versa, you take rubber or glass, we'll never make it into a conducting material. You take silicon or germanium, you can change conductivity over orders and orders of magnitude. So that's a really very important distinguishing feature of semiconductors. Also, in the case of semiconductors, electrical conductivity depends on the electric field, on light, on temperature, magnetic field, and so on. Unlike any other solids, those are very special solids. Actually, in nature, there are very few of them. Actually, we find semiconductors in this part of the periodic table. Most of, I mean, elemental semiconductors are located in the fourth group, and most important among them is, of course, silicon, as you may know. All other semiconductors that we use, combining elements from the third and fifth, group of periodic table and second and sixth are man-made, are synthetic semiconductors. Gary Massner, Gary Knight, indium phosphide and so on, are all man-made semiconductors. Very, very useful. This, this element is, is by far the most important and that's really the one that carried the progress of technical civilization over the last 15 years. Okay, uh, semiconductors are everywhere. <coughs> There's not a single element with on-off switch which will not contain some kind of a semiconductor uh, element in the diode or, or, or transistor. Uh, uh, you look at the gadgets you use every day and then and they are stuck with semiconductor. Every part of it is, is operation it's based on, on, on the use of semiconductor elements against such as integrated circuits, diodes and transistors and so on and so forth. Uh, I mentioned transistors already several times in my, in my few minutes long presentation. Uh, and really, transistor is, is, is the technology driver. Okay? Uh, the scaling of the transistor geometry is that's what can be kind of get, get us to <coughs> where we are in terms of, of uh, nanotechnology these days. Uh, this is a schematic cross-section of the transistor. This is the, the SEN image of the transistor. And there's one, one feature of the transistor which is called gate length, which is defining the operation transistor. We try to make it shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter so that electrons from the source and drain be moving faster and faster and faster. A short time means higher switching speed, meaning higher performance, meaning superior cap cap computational capabilities. In, in our search for the improvement in, in nanoelectronics, we, we went all the way from one micrometer long gate in some 20 years ago, all the way down to 22 nanometer long gate in state-of-the-art chips that you are using currently in your on laptops, smartphones, and so on. This is a, a magnified picture of the part of the device, and, and we create those features in the fully controlled fashion. We control the thickness of this high-k dielectric within the fraction of nanometer. We have tools. We have developed tools. We are fully in control of solid-state materials these days. Okay? And this is, this is a, a, a exemplification of, of, of what we can really do in terms of materials in engineering. Now, <coughs> you improve transistor, you, you, you shorten the gate, you make it work faster, and then you take three billions of those stuff into one chip, make it into the, I don't know, whatever, for instance, core one seven Intel chip, you package in the package, and then you enclose with the Intel uh, uh, lid on top, and you put into your laptop, suddenly all your games are, 
are running faster and video is streaming with no objects, no, no, dis no difficulties. Uh, you access, you browse internet, uh, the, the great ease and, and, and with no delay whatsoever. So that's basically what was driving technology. That's what got us to, to this uh, nanotechnology regime. I'd like to really emphasize there's no revolution in all this. This is just the result of the hard work and, 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 and natural progress. Okay? We, we, we were following certain things in, in, in microelectronics and then became nanoelectronics. And as a result, we, we developed uh, tools which allow us also Professor Rose and our colleagues, chemists, biologists, biochemists, to manipulate and observe matter and our world at the really nanometer scale. I may be too selfish in saying this, but I think this is all because our need to spend money, actually our willingness to spend money on improved, continuously improved gadgets, uh, which was feeding funds back to interest to Shiba's IBMs of this world, that in turn was developing tools that we are now using to advance our civilization, basically. That's really uh, the way it is. Okay, now one thing which I would <coughs> like to, to mention to some of you who may not be immediately familiar with, this is a slightly different aspect of, of, uh, of uh, nanoscience, nanotechnology. The message is very clear. Physical properties, material, depend on the dimension. What you will see in terms of physical properties in the case of bulk material, in the material where electrons can roam freely and are not interacting with each other, will be very different in the case of the same, exactly the same material. Imagine it's a silicon, okay, with a bulk silicon, a wafer, a piece of silicon. Physical properties of this silicon in this form will be very different from silicon that is squeezed out of one dimension into one atomic layer thick features, such as, for instance, quantum well or ultra thin thing. Physical properties, chemical properties remain unchanged completely. Physical properties of silicon in this form are very different than they are in the form of bulk material. We continue the process and, and reduce geometry of, of material along uh, x axis. And we make it into the nanotube or nanowire. Pro physical properties of silicon in this form are very different than in this form in this form. And we didn't change chemical properties of the material, the same silicon. Same silicon bonded to other silicons using covalent bonding, no difference. Yet physical properties of this silicon and this are very different. And we continue the process and as you can see, we end up with the zero-dimensional feature, which is known as quantum dot, which features yet different physical properties, offering us tremendous opportunities in, in building novel, innovative devices and, and the device uh, uh, for all sorts of uh, applications. So I included the slide just for the one and only purpose to make sure that, that we are really aware of the fact that Things happen in a different way as geometry of, of solid changes goes to the threshold. Up to certain geometry, there is no change in the material physical properties. And everything that's going on is described by the laws of conventional classic physics. When you go beyond certain stage and the electrons are no longer roaming freely, start to interact with each other, whether in the two-dimensional electron gas or within the nanodot, the hell breaks loose. Okay? Physical properties of material are completely different and are completely controlled by the different set of rules. We are just entered the weight of quantum physics. Okay? Classical physics is no longer able to describe those phenomena. Okay? So that's the message I would like to convey. Now, in terms of what we are doing in terms of research, at uh, Penn State in, in <coughs> the Department of Electrical Engineering, but this research covers a number of other departments and colleges in, 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 at Penn State. For instance, in, in our case, we are working, actually my colleague Professor Data is working on next generation transistors for ultra low power logic microchips. This is, this is following the Morse law, and the same thing we're discussing earlier, smaller, smaller, smaller maybe 10 nanometer gate as opposed to 22, maybe seven nanometer gates, so our electronics will work even 
better. In my case, I'm working on, on a, on a crystalline quantum dots, which we synthesize using cadmium selenide. Again, they're very, very nanometer scale devices. You can count atoms here. And we use them to build this place of the light emitting diodes that, that uh, we are um, <coughs> fabricating using quantum dots. And we are also using quantum dots to print uh, barcodes, uh, which are undetectable unless you know how to detect them. So they are very suitable in counterfeiting uh, printing and labeling uh, uh, applications. And there is significant amount of, of work on semiconductor technology carried out uh, around campus in the new Millennium Science Complex. Basically, most of it that is being done on the material side as opposed to life science side is, is concerned with one way or another with semiconductor nanotechnology. So I would like to, to end up with the quick comment that semiconductor nanotechnology is cool. I'm, I really believe it's, it's really cool stuff. You should think about it and you, you just change geometry material and then suddenly end up with completely different material for all practical purposes. Although chemically it's still the same material. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that.